you can uh, reference them, uh, you know, for review or for if you miss class one day. Okay, we're, we looked at last time uh, mystery religions, and we looked at some examples of them. But of the mystery religions, most of them do not survive uh, directly into Christian times. The cr Christianity was exclusivistic and basically shut down these. Well, number one, people started stopped going as they become Christian. They stopped going to the mystery religions, and two, eventually Christianity just kind of closed them down as they were closing down pagan temples. So they died out. They survive as literary phenomenon, and they survive as esoterica. Now, but not not as a full fledged mystery religion, but just some of the ideas survive. So what we're going to look at is the two main ideas from the kind of ancient complex or of uh, mystery religions that continue to have significance uh, in later times, and that is form a part of an esoteric tradition, and that is Orphism and Pythagoreanism. And, and Pythagoreanism is not quite a mystery religion, but it, it shares some of the characteristics. So what we need to do is just briefly cover, cover these ideas. Orpheus is, seems to have been a Thracian god. Thrace is the zone north of Greece, modern Bulgaria, uh, Serbia type area, Macedonia, that, that's Thrace anciently, okay? Th there is a cult center of him in Macedonia, which is northern Greece. Orf uh, Orpheus was kind of a, uh, a legendary uh, semi-divine figure, and one of his fundamental myths is Orpheus and Eurydice and, and the descent to the underworld and the return from the underworld. And in this, this is uh, recorded literarily most famously by Ovid's Metamorphosis, Book 11. And so you can go read that account about essentially Orphea, Eurydice is uh, taken down into the underworld and Orpheus manages to try to get her out. Okay? And, and in that form, he becomes the psychopomp. I've explained this term, right? Psychopomp? The leader of a soul, the person that guides a soul either out of the underworld or into heaven or through a mystical uh, experience or something like that. Uh, so because he knows how to get the souls out of the land of the dead, he is uh, followed as kind of a cult uh, of the of resurrection or something like that. In some ways, he's equated a little bit with... Uh, uh, Osiris in that regard, in, in terms of the, you know, syncretism of Greek religion. He is also noted to be able to use music to charm animals. That is, he was a great musician. He plays the lyre. And, and this is important because music, I mean, we view music as a form of entertainment. They view music as magic. Okay? That is to say, you, you pluck a string and it makes this sound. And then you do them in a, in a harmonious series and pluck some together, and it creates this sound and it changes the mood of people, right? Makes them happy, makes them mad, makes them uh, sad, whatever it might be. And so music is, is an esoteric discipline, and it's closely associated with mathematics, geometry, music, and harmony, and all those types of ideas. So Orpheus is kind of the master musician. Now, who is the god of, of music? Apollo is to some degree, and there is a muse of, of music as well. So, so there are gods and goddesses, but he's kind of the intermediary that does this. Now, he's also associated with Dionysius, which was probably syncretism between the Greeks, equating Orpheus and Dionysius. But he, his form of Dionysianism, which tended to be around drunken orgies or associated with that type of stuff, what was more uh, moderate and spiritual. He also opposed blood sacrifices. So, so there's a huge issue in antiquity as time progressed as to whether or not the gods really want blood sacrifice. You see this in Christianity and Judaism and, and, and so forth. But he kind of uh, eliminates that. He's the first founder of the, of the mysteries. He's kind of the first god that does a mystery. And notice, a lot of these mystery religions are non-Greek. That is, they come from Asia, they come from other countries, and it is, they get entered into Greece as a mystery religion. 
they talk about the seal of the mysteries, that is, their secrets that they know that they don't expand, explain, and there also is the development of symbolic interpretation of Greek myths. What do I mean by that? Okay, you got a story of, of Zeus who goes and rapes a woman and has a kid, and uh, Hera gets mad at him, and he shoots lightning bolts at somebody, right? What's the behavior of Zeus in that story? Well, he's behaving like a Greek barbarian Bronze Age king, but he is behaving unjustly and immorally. He's a jerk, right? So uh, as people st start to develop a, a moral sense, they wonder, are the gods good or are the gods just powerful? A powerful god may exist, but he may not be good and just. And, and so uh, lots of people started to interpret stories allegorically. And this, is, this develops in, uh, in Athens, or uh, rather, um, Alexandria. And it develops originally as a means of drawing moral lessons from Homer, but becomes a fundamental way to deal with all sorts of stories that no longer make sense. So when you go back to the age of Homer, of course the god's powerful. He's, he's doesn't have to be just. A god is a god because he's got power. And Zeus can do whatever he wants with his power. Doesn't make, he doesn't have to be just. Uh, but as time progresses, then they want to uh, allegorize some of these things to make the gods more just. And the idea that God should be good essentially starts with Socrates and Plato in, in Greek, or at least, I mean, it probably starts earlier than that, but that's the fullest expression that God is wise and, and wisdom leads to goodness, so God must be all-knowing, all-wise, all-good, uh, just, and so forth. And that's part of the reason why um, Socrates rejects the gods of the Greek myths and therefore is put to death as a blasphemer. Anyone you remember that story? Yeah? So I was just wondering, uh, how common was uh, human sacrifice in early Greece and about what point? In the Orpheus story, well, by the time that we start getting written accounts of this stuff, it's it's done with. Okay. Uh, it was blood sacrifice, not human. Blood sacrifice is animal sacrifice, and that was very common up through fourth, fifth centuries A.D. when the, when the Christians closed down the temples. Okay, so is there any point where they had human sacrifice then? There seems to have been human sacrifice in antiquity, okay. uh, archaic Bronze Age times. By classical times, it died out. They're not doing it. But you have a, uh, the story of uh, Agamemnon and, what's his daughter's name? Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter before the Trojan War story. One of, the, one of uh, Euripides' plays is about that. Yeah. Clytemnestra, I think. No, that's his wife. Anyway, I can't remember the name of the daughter. But at any rate, so, so it's in there, but it's very archaic by the time we're getting classical Greek records. Uh, now notice, uh, Orpheus is destroyed by the Maneids who go mad and tear him to pieces. And that's like Osiris, who's also torn to pieces. Huh? Maneids are kind of like uh, demon goddesses, like the Harpies or something. And then his head is, survives and goes to Lesbos, where it's found in the temple, and, and it's a oracular head. This is the very archaic practice of taking the head of someone, supposedly containing a spirit or something, and putting it in a place, and then getting revelations, divination, necromancy from this head. And this leads to what's called necromancy, which is divination by uh, necros is, is, um, is Greek, uh, dead in Greek, and, and mant, uh, mantos, mantikos, is divination or prophecy. And so necromantikos is divination by summoning a spirit of a dead who will then tell you some secret that the living don't know. What's the most famous literary manifestation of Greek or Latin necromancy? That's not a Greek or Latin. That's not, that's not. And it's, and it's not really necromancy. Yeah, anyway, that's a different thing. Uh, this is when Odysseus is trying to get back, he has to consult a particular prophet. And that prophet's dead, so he summons the spirit of the dead. Uh, I can't remember what book in Odysseus this is, or in the Odyssey it is. But, and then Aeneid does the same thing. He goes down into hell to summon a spirit to, to give him a prophecy. And the most famous biblical example is when Saul consults the um, 
the witch of Eindor, and she summons up the spirit of Samuel, who gives a cursing prophecy to Saul. So that seems to be related to this type of practice that of the oracular head. And then he is brought up into heaven by the gods, becomes one of the gods, and his lyre becomes the constellation Lyra. So he's a very important figure in that regard. Now, Orphism is an archaic religion which becomes allegorized and, and mysticized into a religion about, uh, you know, uh, rising from the dead and resurrection and so forth, but it is also linked in with number, music, geometry, and dance. All of these things are uh, interrelated in ancient concepts. They were very, especially in Pythagoreanism, and, and these overlap. Pythagoras, Plato, and Orpheus are all interconnected in some way or another. Now, now they're not at all the same thing. I'm just saying they interrelate like that. Okay, So there's a core of ideas about harmony and number and music and, and so forth. On uh, the door to Plato's academy, it allegedly was written a sign, if you cannot do mathematics, do not enter here. That is, you have to, there's this mysticism of number, okay? And geometry, number, music, and dance are all interrelated, right? Music is harmonious sound, dance is harmonious action, poetry is harmonious words, numbers, and uh, music, and so forth, okay? So, there's also a mystical temple of to uh, Orpheus and Hyperborea. What's Hyperborea? The land north of the yeah. Borean winds. It's the far north. It's like Scandinavia or something. It's a mythic land, though. So there's a, a mythical temple in Hyperborea? A mythical temple in Hyperborea, which is, in the, in the Greek mind, was what we would call Scandinavia or England or something like that. But it is a mythic imagination of what Scandinavia was like. Some people think that Stonehenge may be the Hyperborean temple that the Greeks are talking about, or something like Stonehenge, maybe not that specific one, but there were, are these uh, megalithic stone temples in, the, in, the, in that area. Okay, here's some, here's some sources on uh, Orpheus. There are some papyri that have been found, and also some uh, 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 gold tablets with uh, afterlife spells on them that are buried with the dead. The most important, these things are, have been discovered archaeologically and help us understand original Orphism. However, the Orphic hymns are the texts which have survived in traditional form and were read by later class assistants and so forth and influencing their ideas. And, and so the hymns of Orpheus, there's a couple of different editions of them. They are, you know, essentially songs that supposedly Orpheus wrote that then have influence on later esoteric thought. And th this is some literary accounts of, of uh, Orpheus. You know, they're, they're essentially mythic tellings of the story. Okay, any questions on Orphism? So notice that Orphism survives not in its original form, but in the influence of these Orphic texts, and therefore he is kind of a, a patron intellect of, by intellect, remember, I mean a a spirit, a, a spirit with mind in it, so it's kind of like an angel and kind of like an ancient Greek god. It's basically the Greeks believed in gods, which were theoi. Theos is the Greek for god. And they believed in demons, which you could call a spirit of some sort, or you could even call it an angelos, which is a mess, messenger, angel is a messenger. And these spirits were called daimon, uh, daimonos, and, and it, it means a lesser god. But it turns into demon in uh, Christian thought, right? So when I use the term daimon, I mean I refer to the Greek lesser god spirit. So so a, a forest would have a daimon in it. Okay, the Latins tend to call this a, a genius, and it's li linked to the Arabic jinn. And the genius is a spirit that can kind of influence a person. So the emperor has a genius. We say a person is a genius. The ancients would say he has a genius. That is, he has a spirit that talks to him. And Socrates, or guides him, or in, in, um, you know, uh, influences him. 
Socrates claimed he had a daimon that spoke to him. He says, I, you know, I, hear, I hear voices, and it tells me to do things, and I do them, which is really interesting. You know, is he schizophrenic, or is there really a voice? Or, you know, anyway, what's going on? So what I'm saying is these daimons get turned into demons in Greek, in, in Christian thought. It's not that Zeus didn't exist, it's, it's that he's a, a demon, a deceiving people. But they turn into sometimes called intellects or intelligences or spirits or angels in esoteric thought. So, so uh, when I talk about an intellect, I mean a spiritual being who has a mind and independent power and so forth that can interact with human beings in different ways. And, and at this level, you have spirit magic or angel magic which is associated with these daimons, but there can be good and bad daimons. A daimon is not good or bad, it's just a, power, a spirit, powerful spirit. There can be bad ones, kako daimons and agatha daimons, evil demons and good demons. For, okay? Angel, angel magic I have seen from everywhere, all over the world. I have met people who practice angel magic. Right. Like, especially in Eastern Europe. Right. They're like really into it. So it like, doesn't even die out at all, it's just like really a thing. Well, uh, it, it goes up, up and down. But it's, it's resurged as part of uh, New Age stuff. But if you look at Eastern European uh, practices, they're probably more archaic than the New Age. But they've been influenced by New Age indirectly. Yeah, yeah oh, oh, absolutely. Summoning a spirit or an angel or something. I mean, we saw John Dee was doing this all the time, right? Was, was he thinking this was a bad thing to do? No, this was a divine work. The angels were there to give him knowledge. And he could summon them through through what we would call magical invocations, but he would just say their prayers to to the angels to come give him knowledge and wisdom and so forth. So all of these things are syncretized. Demons, angels, spirits, intellects, they're all syncretized by Renaissance times into one concept. Okay, back to Pythagoras. Pythagoras, uh, here are uh, sources. Uh, the Ridwig is kind of a biography and, you know, the best introduction to the actual life of Pythagoras. And then Guthrie's book is a collection of all the major primary texts associated with Pythagoras. And much, most of what we have about Pythagoras is really late stuff. That is, it's 500 years after he lived and his people arguing about what he really taught. So, you know, getting back to the original Pythagoras is hard, but... Here are some of the things that are associated with Pythagoras. Number one is he's very much into mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and uh, harmony and ratios. So he's creating, he believes that the world is composed of numbers. And, it, and it's not like modern science where we use numbers to model astrophysics. I mean, he's talking about geometric forms and, and patterns of numbers. And er everything is associated with numbers, geometry, the, the heavens move in precise geometric patterns, and uh, human beings can make these uh, these patterns most easily through music. And in fact, when we make really good music, we are imitating the harmony of the heavens. I mean, we are imitating the celestial balance of sound and harmony and music and form and, and uh, shape and... Uh, you know, linear uh, things, I mean, all sorts of stuff. Okay, so, so that's one core set of ideas, and this gets carried on into Renaissance times as well. Yes? I guess I heard that Pythagoras, they were obsessed with the dodecahedron, like the most beautiful shape or something like that. Uh, I guess, could you talk a little bit more about that function? Well, um, th there's, you know, there's, this is the geometry that you find in Euclid, Euclid's elements is just a description of basic geometric patterns that you can develop. You know, uh, a uh, dot, a line, triangle, uh, you know, uh, square, and then they can move into three-dimensional shapes as well. You can go from a square to a cube. I guess a triangle can create, I don't know, what a pyramid shape and so forth. Okay. Well, if you look at Euclid, he's just talking about it in purely abstract terms. What uh, Pythagoreans did was take uh, geometry as one of the, the uh, kind of pure uh, dimensions of ratio and proportion and harmony and mysticize it. 
esotericize it. So each form had a different, you know, uh, aspect to it. And the dodecahedron, I guess, is the twelve-sided thing where it all fits together. Uh, and you know, that was, I think, that's as high as you can get to make a actual structured form without things getting out of control, right? I guess you can do it with twenty-seven or anything, probably, but. For them, the 12 was the kind of a magical number, signs of the zodiac, months of the year, things like that. And you turn it into a form that is 12 based. Okay, does that make sense? So it's, it's a mystical interpretation of, of the practical side of Euclid. Okay, they're also into all sorts of ascetic practices. That is to say, uh, sexual abstinence, not eating, uh, not sleeping, all these types of things get involved in esoteric practices as well. They were vegetarians, and notice Orpheus is against animal sacrifice, and that is in, port, in part the question of, of vegetarianism. And the idea behind this is you're eating grandpa if you eat, you know, a sheep or something, or at least maybe not explicitly Pythagoras would say that, but, you know, that, that's potentiality. Uh, so anything, any living being is, has got some type of noose or spirit in it, okay? You don't want to destroy those. And also, um, uh, she believed in reincarnation, which is, in Greek terms, met uh, met <laughs> metempsychosis, which is the uh, transfer of the soul, or the psuche is the soul, okay? So transmigration of the soul is reincarnation. That is, your soul mind will can be reborn in somebody else. Plato talks about this a little bit. He gets that idea from uh, Pythagoras. Also, uh, one of the cool things about Pythagoreanism is the uh, prohibition of eating beans because beans may have contained souls for some reason they thought this, and maybe because it looks like a fetus. But when you eat beans, it also gives you gas, and then you break wind, and the idea being that if that's a soul coming out of your being released from the bean or something like that. You know, so there's some wild stuff they're talking about. If you, uh, when I, w I would always tell my kids, do not violate the prohibition of Pythagoras, which is breaking wind at the table. So we, that, we'd laugh about that, right? My wife didn't like that, but that's what we did. Anyway, uh, now, Pythagoras is kind of the starter. We have a couple of uh, Pythagorean philosophers, Parmenides and Empedocles, uh, <laughs> who uh, survive only in fragments in later philosophers, but we can kind of get a sense of how that philosophy went through them. Plato was influenced to some degree by Pythagoras as well. There are He talks about him a little bit, and there seems to be Pythagorean ideas there. Philolaus is kind of the guy who... who formalizes and finalizes it. And then what we're really talking about when we talk about the influence of Pythagoras is Neo-Pythagoreanism. That is to say, with all these guys, there's the original core ideas that they taught, and then there's centuries later with Pythagoras, this is probably, he was probably six centuries, so we're talking four or five centuries later, people, how they interpreted what he said. So Neo-Pythagoreanism is a Hellenistic interpretation of Pythagoras which became the norm, and most of what we know about Pythagoras comes from Neo-Pythagoreans, not from Pythagoras himself. We have no documents from him. Okay, and then likewise, Neoplatonism is the, you know, five six centuries after Plato, how they misinterpreted him. And again, modern scholars will say these guys misinterpreted Orpheus and or Pythagoras and, and Plato. They thought that this is the you know what they were really teaching. Okay. And then here's some more uh, books on uh, Pythagoras, or, uh, yeah, okay, we already mentioned this one. This kind of has a collection. And these guys are Neo-Pythagoreans who, who get into all the harmonies and that mathematics stuff. It's really, it's called sometimes numerology, which means the study of numbers, but for practical terms, numerology means the study of the, the kind of mystical esoteric use of numbers, okay? So Plato would call it, in Greek it's mathematica, it's just number, you know, adding, subtracting is mathematics to, to the Greeks. Uh, and 
Some of them thought it's just a bunch of numbers, and some of them thought there's all sorts of mystical esoteric meaning behind all these numbers. And that that's the esoterica of numerology. Yeah? Is the, the way that um, a lot of Jews will put numbers to different words in the Torah? Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that later, but that is in some ways numerological. It's gematria. It's a different form of numerology. And it's, it's, a, it's a bit different because... I'll explain this later, but gematria is kind of a form of numerology. But it, numerology isn't really about the relations of numbers in and of themselves as abstractions. This is about the relation of number to letters and words. And so it's, it, it overlaps, but it's not exactly the same. Okay? Questions on that? Uh, okay, let's look at Goodrick Clark, Chapter 2. We're behind note. Uh, we will catch up a little bit later, but right now we're behind. Uh, in Chapter 2, uh, Goodrick Clark, that's, this is the one we were supposed to do for last time. I right? read Chapter 3 for today, but we're, we're behind. Uh, Goodrick Clark uh, is talking about, now notice what we're doing here is, is each period we're kind of doing two different topics. One is we're doing an ancient idea which becomes, either was inherently or becomes esoteric and becomes important in later esoteric and mystical thought. And number two, we are doing uh, kind of a modern thing. So, so part of the course is we start with the Renaissance and go forward. Part of the course is we start with antiquity and go forward. We're doing that kind of in the first part, because and then uh, we'll, after lecture 10 or so, we switch over and we'll just start looking at Jewish mysticism, and we'll go a lot more in depth than that. Right now we're kind of doing a survey of you know, ancient and Renaissance era ideas that get all jumbled up and interconnected in all sorts of strange ways. Does that make sense? So we're kind of jump back and forth. Just bear in mind we're on a two-track thing. One is antiquity, one is Goodrick Clark on, on uh, early modern. Okay? So hopefully you can follow along on that. Now, Goodrick Clark started his book with a discussion of Hellenistic period um, esotericism. And what he looked at were the ideas that were most important for later esoteric thought. What he's really interested in is from the Renaissance on. That's what he's talking about. Uh, and so he, he discussed you know, Hermeticism and stuff, and then he jumps to the Renaissance. Why skip the medieval period? I don't know, because they really had a lot of strange beliefs and magic and all sorts of things. That's, that's very true. But he has a specific reason for doing that. Yeah? I'm not positive, but because, maybe because classical antiquity and Hellenistic ideas didn't really influence the medieval culture that much. Yeah, basically all of the Greek texts were lost in medieval periods. That's number one. Uh, and, and so we have the survival of Latin texts, but in reality, most esoterica is Hellenistic, Greek, Alexandrian, and if you don't are not reading the Greek books, you're not getting that stuff. Now, it does survive in Byzantium. All of the Greek texts that the Renaissance guys pick up are uh, preserved by the Byzantines, who were reading them in whatever ways. Sometimes they just made a copy and stuck it in the library because it was an ancient book they had, but sometimes they read them and interpret them and stuff. Like Plato, they were wild about Plato in the Byzantine era, and everybody who got educated uh, learned, read Plato and Aristotle. This was just part of the standard education for the Byzantine uh, arist aristocrats and clerics and so forth. Okay, but what he's interested in is what he calls Western esotericism, which is a phenomenon that grew up in the Renaissance by the combination of Hermeticism, Kabbalah, magic, etc., etc. Hermeticism is something that had been essentially forgotten. There was one Latin text of the Hermetica that survived the Asclepius. Other than that, it was, it was lost to the West. So he's focusing solely on the West, number one. And number two is he's focusing on the forms of esoterica that derive from this Renaissance synthesis that occurs, that he discusses in chapter two, and then continue as a ongoing, full-blown tradition up till the present. Okay? I mean, modified in all sorts of different ways, but all of these Renaissance ideas form the foundation for esoteric thought in Western Europe from the Renaissance, that's 15th century Italy, on till the present. Although lots of other things get interjected, as he'll be discussing later. This is the core. So he's talking about one specific tradition. And notice, uh, 
he's, he talks about the fact that the Greek texts survive among the Byzantines. The question is, when did they get into the West? And they get in in Renaissance Florist. And then we'll explain how that happens in a second. Now, somebody had a hand up or a comment? Yeah. I was just going to ask, if, um, if this is the same sort of stuff, I don't know if you saw the Sherlock Holmes movie where they had all the magic that was involved, the re more recent one that just came out. But I was wondering if that was that same tradition because they had like, which one? The stuff in the movie was based upon the Victorian era Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Oh, the Golden yes. Dawn? Oh, yeah. There you so, go. yeah. Is there a new Sherlock Holmes movie out? Uh, it's a older one, the one that came out in like 2010. Oh, 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 the the one with Don, no, Down, Downey? Yeah, Robert Downey. Anyway. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that, that is, that is uh, not the Order of the Golden Dawn, but it's a uh, fictionalized form of it, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yes. Okay. Absolutely. The Golden Dawn was the major late 19th century synthesis, resynthesis of all this stuff. Kind of starts in the Renaissance and gets fragmented and gets recombined and fragments and recombines and stuff in different ways. But yeah, that's right. Okay, now, why Florence? Number one is Florence was really rich. It was a center of banking, so it got really rich in the Renaissance. It was one of the most wealthy countries in the world, even though it was a city-state. Militarily, it was weak, but wealth, it was huge. Secondly, was the phenomenon of uh, Renaissance humanism. In medieval times, if you were going to get an education, you got a, a religious education. That is, you learn how to be a priest. Now, lots of guys got the education, didn't become priests. They became what are known as clerks, which is just cleric. I mean, it's, you know, they were literate people, but they still went through a religious education. By the time of the Renaissance, the rich families wanted their guys to be educated so they could do, uh, you know, they rewrite and run their business and everything like that. Uh, but they didn't, nobody wanted to study, you know, patristics. Oh, no, no, I can't study that. So they formed what they called the humanities. The humanities being, theology being the study of divine things, and the humanities being the study of human things, right? Now, a humanist then is one who studies literature, art, philosophy, that type of stuff, as opposed to a theologist who studies God, religion, patristic science, scholastic theology, all that type of stuff. Now, lots of guys did both. It wasn't you had to do one or the other. And the humanist was not an anti-theist as it is today. If you talk to guys and say, I'm a humanist, they generally mean I'm an atheist, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in any of that stuff. That's not the way humanist was. Many of the great humanists were very religious, like Thomas More. Uh, you know, very famous humanist and also very religious guy. Okay, the humanists then wanted to read the classics, and, and that meant the Latin classics, because they're fun literature and cool stories, and, you know, none of this boring uh, how many angels can dance on the head of the pin stuff that they didn't want to worry about. Now, uh, so there was this movement, the humanist movement, that really gets started in the 14th century, but uh, spreads widely in the 15th century, and it is strongly influenced by the coming of uh, Greek books to Italy. Now, the way this occurred was, number one, in, in the Middle Ages, most people didn't read Greek. There were a few who learned it, and they sometimes translate books, but Greek was not a, a major scholar in language in medieval Europe. It, they start, it starts to become major in the uh, 15th century. And in part, that's because the Italians were doing so much business with the Byzantines. And in part, it's because Byzantines being the medieval Greeks, right? You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Greece, Turkey, Constantinople, that, that cluster, cultural cluster. But in part, it's because the Turks in the 14th century, or 15th century, rather, are taking over Byzantium. And Constantinople will fall in 1453. What do monks and professors do when the war comes? They run away, right? They're, they don't stand and fight at the battlements to def defeat the evil Turks. They run away. And, and they'll leave their children behind, but they will definitely take their books. So what you have is the influx of a number of scholars bringing books into Italy. That's the closest place where they could go. So these scholars come in, and they bring in Greek books. And, and in, Ren in Florence, the Medici family was a big humanist family, and they were they knew about Greek learning, but they didn't have any. And so when these Greek guys start coming in, they say, come, come, you know, we'll pay you money. Come and teach everybody Greek. So they started Greek classes. They started getting Greek books. And then at the same time, what comes along is the printing press in 1453, right? Gutenberg. 
And then they start saying, well, we can print some of these books. And so you get this revival of Greek knowledge, not just in Florence, but for esoteric thought, Florence was the big center for esoteric thought. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. The other thing was these refugees would bring books and they would sell them because, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, you've lost your land, you've lost your home, uh, you've got a few books and you sell them so you can survive. If you, if you went to Israel 10 or 15 years ago when all the big Russian influx of Russian Jews, who many of whom were actually Christians pretending to be Jews, but at any rate, the Russian Jews were coming in, and you could buy icons all over Jerusalem. They were selling tons of, you know, three, four, five hundred year old icons everywhere. That's because all these Russians stole or had these icons and brought them in and sold them to, you know, buy a house or whatever. And that was the same thing with the Greek books in the West at this period. So a big influx of Greek scholars, a big influx of Greek books, due to the political situation in the Byzantium, and also due to the rise of humanism and the rise of printing, which were independent phenomena which cluster together to form this uh, revival. Now, what the Medicis do is form a Platonic academy, and their goal is to revive the knowledge of Plato. Now, what they're really doing is reviving Neoplatonism, which is the uh, late antique interpretation of Plato, but that's fine. Their goal was to bring Plato back into play. And so they, they look for copies of Plato and they look for copies of, and they look to translate Plato. And then eventually they look to print a Greek and a Latin editions of Plato printed, right? So what you see then is this widespread uh, uh, of uh, Platonic ideas in there, and it's generally as interpreted by Neo, uh, Neoplatonic form, yeah. Why did they concentrate so much on Plato and not Aristotle? They had Aristotle in Latin. Plato had been lost. Oh, they had so one book of Plato, the Timaeus, in Latin. All the rest of the works of Plato were lost, but Aristotle had been translated into Latin, and he survives. Now, they did try to print the Greek editions of Aristotle, but that wasn't new learning. Right. Plato was the new learning. Okay. So what this meant then, in practical terms, is that these guys are starting to rediscover lost learning. And once they start to realize there's all these ideas we have known nothing about, we've lost them, they start looking for them in every way they can find. Now the classical Latin had been preserved, but the Greek had been lost, and although the biblical knowledge had been preserved, what had been lost? The Greek and Hebrew originals, all they had was they used the Latin translation of the Bible. So new biblical knowledge was found, that is, Greek and Hebrew originals. Also lost Hebrew knowledge was found, that is, non-biblical Hebrew texts. And then uh, all sorts of esoteric texts. Now, to the Renaissance humanists, all of these were of equal value and importance. They were all equally true. That is, they didn't think that... Uh, you know, an esoteric text was just silly nonsense that somebody's making up, was just as valuable. Now, what comes into this uh, is Ficino. He's, he's a scholar who worked for the Medici family at the Platonic Academy. As they started getting these books, the Medici said, we want you to publish a complete edition of Plato in Greek and translate it. And Ficino says, awesome, I'm going to do that, and he does. And he actually writes a book on the Platonic theology, he calls it, and it's all interpreting Plato, which is all Neoplatonic interpretation of Plato. But they also found these book, uh, the Corpus Hermeticorum. Now, these books are attributed to Hermes, okay? But they are, in fact, as we're going to read, they are, in fact, Hellenistic uh, theosophy, uh, theology, speculation, uh, magic, philosophy, all mixed together. The question was, what's the relationship between Hermes and Plato? And the, the question, that's a question because uh, they're looking for the Prisca Theologia, the, the, the most original, pristine source of these ideas. The more ancient, the better. Ancient is, is like True knowledge comes from antiquity, and it gets degenerated and lost through the Middle Ages. And now we're rediscovering the rebirth of this lost knowledge, be it Greek philosophy or Greek history or whatever. So the more ancient, the better. That's an assumption. And the idea here is that you've got Hermes, 
And he was a god, but he's also a real guy. And they called him Hermes Trismegistus, which means thrice great, the greatest Hermes. Okay? And, and we'll, we'll read his writings here. They thought that he, his ideas, antedated Plato, and that Plato was influenced by and systematized hermetic thought. Now, they were wrong about that, but that's what they thought. And there are clear parallels between Plato and Hermes. But that's because Hermes, the Hermes Trismegistus stuff, was influenced by Neoplatonism. Does that make sense? So they got that wrong. And it wasn't until the, six, uh, I think it was 1616, that Casabon wrote a book, I can't remember the exact date, but around then, a guy named Isaac Casabon wrote a book in which he demonstrated uh, philologically and historically that Hermes was written after Plato, and then Hermes declines in significance. But in the 1470s, in uh, the Platonic Academy in Florence, they came to the conclusion that Hermes was written before Plato and more important than Plato, and so they stopped the Plato edition and said, go do the Hermetica. And that's what Ficino did. He, he, uh, he uh, top translated all the Hermetica. Well, at first they did an edition of it, a printed edition, and translated it into Latin. And then he wrote his Platonic Theology, which is a mixture of Hermes and Plato. Okay. So what happens, what, what this does is create this esoteric, they call it theology or philosophy. I mean, to them, philosophy is the love of wisdom. Theology is speaking about God, and you, they're, they're interrelated. We tend to distinguish philosophy as pure rationalism and ethical questions from uh, you know, theology, which is speculation about the divine. We separate the two. They, they merge them together. OK? Another assumption they had was that all ancient knowledge is one. That is, there is a pristine, remember it's, it's the Prisca Theologia, the original pristine theology, which came in many different forms and then was transmitted and broken up. So here you have the original revelation. It is broken and fragmented in different groups to get different parts, and then they want to bring it all back together and restore it, okay? So the idea is that all ancient knowledge is originally one, and they've got to synthesize it. So magic, philosophy, Judaism, Christianity, esotericism, all these things teach one set of core ideas that they all share. Now, in reality, this is somewhat true, because all of the forms of Philosophy, magic, Judaism, and Christianity all have Neoplatonic underpinnings. And we'll be discussing Neoplatonism in a few days, and we'll go into depth in it. But they all have that underpinning. So in fact, I mean, they were right in a sense, but again, they got the chronology wrong. Okay, it's backwards. They thought it was the pristine version. In fact, it's a late synthesis. 